The Lord be with you. And with your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. The feast of the dedication was taking place in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus walked about in the temple area of the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, we have a nice, healthy congregation today. What's going on out there that I don't know about, besides everything? You remember days when things would get more challenging in the church and in the world, and, and more people will actually come to church? Yeah. Now, it's like things go bad, it's like fewer people come to church. I only highlight it because, you know, uh, our daily mass group, uh, many are joyfully with the Lord now. So it's nice to see larger numbers. Not larger people, larger numbers. It strike me, strikes me today, and you may have noticed as well, the last several days, really for four weeks now since, um, since Easter, that we're really uh, being called or identified to be with joy. The joy of our redemption, however that opening prayer went. Do you feel, do you feel in an active way, the joy of your redemption? That's really a question that you might ponder. I know that's hard because we get into social habits and patterns, and the habit and the pattern is, well, complain. We all know it's a challenging time. People talk to me. They come to confession. They do various ways that, you know, they're just stressed out because of American politics and, and wars in various places, and that's something to be stressed out, of, stressed out about. But it seems like it's a contrast to our prayer when we've been reminded almost daily to be grateful and aware of the joy of our salvation. There's two sides of that, and it's recognized in the readings today. It seems like a complaint, and I, I think it probably is. So the Jews gathered around him and said, hey, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Just give us the bottom line, will you? You know, give us the final answer. Is that language for today? You know, if you're the Christ, just tell us, will you please? Is that a complaint or is it just impatience? And that's kind of the social norm as well. I want it and I want it five minutes ago. I told you, but you do not believe. And struck too in the last couple of days, I think it was just yesterday, we had the gospel that we only come to Christ because the Father draws us. At first blush, that seems backwards to me. Because in, isn't it Jesus that brings us to the Father? It is. It's the Spirit that awakens us in faith to come to Jesus, and then Jesus brings us to the Father. And it should break the illusion or the ill perception that God is somehow sitting in heaven for the, so that the Father and the Son can do all the work on earth. Again, it conveys to us the immediacy and the activity of the unity of the Trinity. God's here. 
So rather than saying Father, the nature of the divine draws us. That's true. That's why we come to faith. Because there's something in us, God, drawing us. That's the Father that draws us. I told you, but you don't believe. In other words, they're not perceiving or recognizing or accepting, trusting that it's God drawing them through this man, Jesus, who we proclaim clearly and openly to be the Son of God. They're probably blinded, as we are in our own ways, by their own church religion. Sometimes the baby gets put in second place, or as the saying goes, gets thrown out with the bathwater. The religion becomes more important than the God whom the religion is supposed to reveal. And maybe in some cases, I don't mean to be overly critical, but you know, the temple and the sacrifices at that time, the people, the leaders, the rabbis, etc., priests in particular, were really benefited economically because they were paid every time they offered a sacrifice. And there's a tension there, right? So that, you know, hey, yeah, this religion is really important (laughs) because it serves us well. That's why Jesus says, you don't don't believe me because you won't accept the drawing, the, the inclination to really know God in a true and real way in your hearts. The works I do, raising from the dead, healing the sick, proclaiming mercy and forgiveness to sinners, Those works testify to my Father's name in me. But you don't believe because you are not among my sheep. Meaning, you don't believe. You don't let the power of the divine draw you to the power of the divine. We see that in the first reading. Yesterday and again today, You see, God doesn't see lines and divisions. You know, if you stood over a map of the United States and, you know, this is the map of Michigan and there's the line and then there's Illinois and Chicago and then there's Ohio and Toledo and, you know, and all the lines. There's no lines for God. This is one nation. This is another. We're all God's people. So just because you're a Jew, you automatically are known to God and you love God because, well, you're you're Jewish, you're from Israel, But people from uh, Greece and and, and Gentile people, they're not going to be drawn to God? Of course they are. And so the word comes to them because they are equally drawn to God. And Christ is meant for them as well. And a great number was drawn to them, drawn to the waters of baptism. It doesn't come in this reading, but I think it's pretty, I'm pretty sure it's Antioch. How does that verse go? Probably coming up tomorrow. That the rejoicing rose to fever pitch in the city because all were turning to the Lord. And then we have, I think it's, is it Irenaeus or Athanasius? I think it's Irenaeus. Through whom, in Antioch, Christians were first called Christian. There's power and identity in that name, Christian, because it reveals Jesus and who we say we are in him and that we know or are called to know his identity in us. Ponder these things so that when you pray or find yourself stressed regarding the stresses of the world, and there's many, American politics and and wars and oppressions and, and tensions between nations, please. Again, God's will, not your will, because then we're just praying against each other all the time. We're praying God's will. Maybe the last verse of the gospel can be the prayer. The Father and I are one. Could you use that as a mantra today? Because you can use that for yourself, too. If you're one with Christ, you're one with the Father. If you're one with Christ, you have the Spirit, and you are one with the Father. 
I can still remember 40, over 40 years ago sitting in the library at St. John Seminary. It's a dining room now. And that very phrase came to mind, and I've held it ever since. The Father and I are one. I am drawn to God by God's drawing. So are you. In him, we know Christ. And through him, we have the Spirit. Lord, may your will be done.